right, here we are, uh, live on the uh, Stone Roadie Show on assignment. And uh, Craig sent me out here today to uh, to hang out with Gene Odom, because uh, Gene Odom's always uh, a great guy to have on the on the podcast. And so uh, I'm gonna turn the camera around here and uh, I'm gonna flip it around here. And, Try to get both me and Gene in here. There, there I am. And there's Gene, right there. Say hi, Gene. Hey, how y'all doing? But we don't want we don't want Gene to look too much over here because he got to keep his eyes his eye eye one eye <laughs> his, on the his, road his eye on the road. But you got to watch these damn Yankees down there. Dude. Yeah, because we just came from uh, Yankee Land, Inverness. Inverness, yeah. Over there, Citrus County. Yeah. So anyway, I'm on assignment over here. And I'm gonna flip this back around and show you. We're on our way to uh, over to Jacksonville to, to visit Jimmy Withers because uh, Gene has to get a laptop from Jimmy and get back on Facebook so so he can uh, say hi, oh silver. I'm going to bed. No story tonight. I'm gonna watch Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke. <laughs> but I thought this was a good time. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna go ahead and, and put and put Gene on camera right here, like I did back when we did the West Side tour. And this is the same camera that I had then. It's a good little high definition camera. And uh, when we did the de the uh, the uh, West Side tour, and uh, Gene's going. I want Gene to tell the story about. Ronnie Van Zant. We were talking about it earlier about Ronnie Van Zant catching that bass because uh, we were talking about bass fishing, and a lot of people don't even know where that lake was. Gene, I thought it was in Jacksonville, but it wasn't in Jacksonville, was it? <clears throat> that Oak Island National Forest, <clears throat> uh, south of Palatka. And what was the name of the lake? Delancey. Lake Delancey? Yeah. And how did you guys find that lake, Gene? We fished down the lake for years and years. Um, we used to hunt rabbits and squirrels down there um, in that area. And um, gosh, how we found it? Oh, um, it's not too far from Robin Reservoir, and we was just hunting down there sometime, hunting a place to fish, and we found Lake Delancey. <clears throat> There's a little bitty fish camp on that lake, the only fish camp around. I can't remember the old guy's name that ran it. Um, but we found it, and uh, there were some big old bass in there. Right, how old were you when you guys found that lake? How far was that, do you think, from Jacksonville and the west side where you guys lived? Um, good, good two and a half, three hours, huh? Well, let's see, it's, uh, if you left Jacksonville to go to Palatka, uh, 45, 50 miles, 50, it was probably 75 miles down there. And also it was about 75 miles from Jacksonville to down to Lake Orange Lake where we did a lot of fishing in Orange Lake, uh, Lock Luso. I go by that. We just came by there a few minutes ago. Coming this way, um, teenagers just got driver's license. You know, had no old pickup trucks and no little John boat. But we were, gosh, I'd say 16, 17 years old. I met, got married when I was 18. Um, gosh, 17 maybe. So you guys uh, used to go fishing in that lake, and, and you realized there were some pretty good-sized bass in there, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, they wasn't, back then, you didn't have all this bass tournaments, all these bass fishermen. There wasn't that many people that fished for bass, uh, black bass, uh, back then. And now there's millions and millions of them. It's a big business now, but we used to bass fish before it ever became a fad. 
in Orange Lake, I was called the Bass Man. Because I'd go down there, I'd iron, iron work, and throw that John boat in the back of the truck and run down to Orange Lake and jigger fish at night time and fish on the weekends and did lots of, lots of jigger fishing. And uh, I was called the Bass Man. That jigger fishing, a lot of people, they don't really know what that is, but even Craig, he did some of that. Ronnie showed Craig how to jigger fish. That's when you have like a, a cane pole, right? Yeah. And you and you go up in, into the uh, lilies and you like drop that, drop you a worm down right in those you little holes. A, you only fish with an 18 inch line, about 18 inches. Uh, that's all the line you got on the end of your cane pole. And you get, and you get, get up in the in lily pads or on the grass beds and you, at night time and you take the end of the pole and you you're, you're drifting or somebody's paddling you or if you're lucky enough back then to have a trolling motor you know and you just go on the grass bed chick, 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 and that's how you catch big bass and it'll scare you to death when a bass hits that plug in the middle of the night and it makes that big splashing noise normally it's, it, it'll scare you every time it happens because you're not expecting it you're looking for it but you're not expecting it Big old bass hits it, you know, scared the piss. Is that mostly when you did it in the nighttime? That's how you do jigger fish at nighttime. Oh, only in the nighttime. Yeah, only at nighttime. Yeah. Um, and so, what's how long was your cane pole usually when you did well, that? Well, you had to get a for that kind of fish. You had to have a real stout cane pole. You get the longest one you could get, and you would cut two or three feet off of it to the. So you took the that the, the nimble little, end off. Yeah, yeah. You took the nimble end off of it. And make it a good stout, you know. Because when you hook that bass, you gotta drag that pole back and drag him out of the weeds. And or if you have two people in the boat, you fight him up to the, back, the person in the back or the front, and they'll throw the bass in the boat, you know. And uh, they scare the piss out of you know, when they hit it. So when this, so Ronnie had it in his mind that he wanted to get him a trophy bass, and of course he wanted to uh, have a trophy bass in an old truck it was couple of the things that he wanted, right? Uh, yeah, before he died, he always wanted an old truck and a, he wanted a trophy bass. And, and he so got, he was going to get him a trophy bass and and did he did he want to just go like in early in the morning to uh, that lake and then like do some worm fishing? Yeah. Um, at that time he was real busy and they just And then they rehearsed, you know, seven days a week. And that, at that time, he just wanted to, he wanted to go fishing. And he says, uh, "Man, let's go to Lake Delancey." You know, and I said, "All right, let's go." And I had my old '69 Chevrolet pickup truck and a little 12-foot John boat. And we got out there. Was it on a trailer, or that you put no, it in the back of the truck? back of that pickup truck and um, he it was um, but you, I think you told me that you planned on going and then the next morning when you got up it was raining like hell or something no no we, we got down there and um, driving pulling up getting down in the woods we're just back in the woods where you we dropped the boat in most of the time we didn't have no outboard motor and we'd get close to where we fished at so we had to roll or paddle or whatever. And as soon as we started pulling up to the area where we were going to put the boat in, it started raining. And I backed on up and <clears throat> got close to the lake where we normally would stop at. And it was raining and he says, we waited a few minutes. He said, let's go home, man. He said, I got stuff I can do. Let's just try and go home. I said, no, man. I said, let's stop here shortly. And we used a second. He said, no, come on, man. He said, let's, let's go. He said, I got stuff I can do. You know, I need I, I need to get done. Come on, let's go. I said, man, let's wait a little while, see if it stops. He said, man, let's, let's just go ahead and go. And then about that time, it stopped. Started stopping. 
I said, look, man, look on the hood of the truck. I said, they're stopping right now, slacking up. You know, in just a second, it had quit raining. One of old Florida thunderstorms it had. And uh, we throwed that boat in the water. What time of the uh, morning was it then? Was it yeah. just crack of dawn, maybe? Yeah, it was just, it was just, just sun up, you know? And um, we put the boat in and we went to the left where we'd always start fishing then. And I let him be in the front of the boat and uh, I was in the, in the back of the boat and I would be rowing or paddling, you, you know. Um, I don't think we had a motor at that time or that day, whatever. And uh, we just started. He, he used an old purple Jim Bagley's worm and I used a black. He threw that worm and hit my old eagle grass and, and that worm tangled him and that worm hit the water. As soon as that worm hit the water, that big old bass <sighs> swirled and hit that worm. I said, man, I said, there's your trophy bass right there. Set the hook. And he set the hook on that big old bass. And that morning when we were leaving, when I grabbed the dip net, put the dip net in the back of the boat, it ripped. The, the, the netting rip was rotted. And it, I, said, I just threw it to the side so we didn't take no dip net. We didn't have no dip net. So when he hung the bass, I was fighting on the bass. He said, Mom, we ain't got no dip net. You ain't got dip net. I said, just fight him. Just keep your attention on the line. Keep him out of the grass. Get him over by the boat. And we ain't got no dip net, man. Why are we just freaking out? <laughs> and I yeah. said, just get him over here by the boat. Get him in there. So he finally got the bass over by the boat. He put up a big fight. And I grabbed that big old bass by the mouth and flaunted him in the boat. Man, and Ronnie was just jumping around, screaming, hollering, man, there's my bass, there's my trophy bass. You know, he was really, 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 really happy, freaking out. And I told him, you better stop this, you're going to turn the boat over. You know, and uh, he grabbed me, hugged me. Come on, man, I guess it's, it, it's as cool as hell. Let's go weigh it. You know, I said, we well, just started fishing. <laughs> he so, wanted to leave, huh? Let's go weigh it, man, let's go weigh it. So the guy had a um, basket in the water, a cage. And you could put your fish in that cage and uh, pick them, come back later, or when you got through fishing, and pick your fish up. It's like a live well, you mean? Yeah, yeah. a live well there. I mean, we put that bass in there, weighed it. 11, it was either 11 pound, 8 ounces, or 12 pound. I can't remember. I think it was 11 pound, 8 ounces. 12 pound, right around 12 pounds. Were you guys like, after you had in the boat, I imagine, just like anybody else, you were trying to guess how much that damn bass weighed, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he knew. That was the biggest bass he'd ever seen, plus the biggest bass he'd ever caught. What what kind of uh, gear was he using? He was using a... He was using a um, I believe he had just got his gold ambassador bait casting reel. Oh yeah, those are we nice. Both, we both used that. Uh, he had a, he just got a gold gold one and I had a, I think it was a 5,000 or something bait casting reel and he had a Fenwick Lunker stick. We both had Fenwick Lunker sticks and so uh, we got, we got back in the boat and we went back down and started fishing right past where he uh, caught that bass. And I don't remember, I think I caught one or two or uh, uh, smaller ones. And around the lake, man, I hooked one. I'm telling you what, I don't know how big he was, but me fighting him and that, that drag, I'm fighting I'm fighting this bass. And that went Fenric lunker stick breaks, snaps that lunker stick off. And my first thought was that he's gone. And I was holding on to my reel and my handle. And I went, God, my Ronnie was going, my God, that was a big bass, man. I went, man, and then so the bass started jerking. Take, and I, I grabbed a hold of the thing, and he was taking line yeah, on the drag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went, my God, man. Yeah. And then he pulled off and tore off. And I went, man, didn't break the line. I guess he just pulled out. So I never knew how big it was or what it was, but it was that black worm. I'm using that 99, nine points chance it was a bass you know um and so um 
he got off. And Ronnie went, man, I love him. You know, my locker stick was broke, so let's go. We're ready to go anyway. Ronnie wanted to get that bass home so he could get it to the taxidermy. You know, he was ready to go. Because he didn't want me to catch a bigger bass than he had yeah, that, that day. But I tell you what, it was one of the finest days of my life, and it was the very best day of his life. I don't care what damn what anybody else says, Judy or anybody else says, that was Ronnie Van Zandt's finest day, catching that 12-pound, uh, I think a 12-pound, 8-ounce bass, and his trophy bass. And he got it back. He always wanted an old truck and a trophy bass before he died. He got the old truck, 55 Chevy, and he got that trophy bass, and that was in May, June, July, August, September, October, five months later, he's dead. Oh, so it was just five months later, so that was five when, later. right when he had done the last album. Yeah, he had. And he was at the top of his height and mm -hmm. uh, his music. He had just gotten the bass back from the taxidermy when he died. So were you, were, were you with him when he picked it up, or did you just... No, I don't think I was. Did you, no. you? You got to see he it. Called me. Oh yeah, I he called me. I did. Come on, look at this bad man. Yeah, uh, and he was, he was happy. He was happy. He loved that bass, and that old truck. So he really got what he wanted, you know, before he died. His old truck and his bass. Did he uh, have it on his wall already? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. There's a picture. There's a picture of him standing there watching. What she's watching is a Beta Max. Um, Oh, it was, a, it was like a, a boxing match, wasn't it, or yeah, something? Yeah, Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay. Yeah. And you can see that bass on top of him, uh, on top of the, um, on the wall above that. Did you uh, ever go back to that lake fishing again? Yeah. Um, uh, several times. And then, like I told you, it dried up. I got a stakeholder or something dried up, and then when it came back, it split. Um, there was a there's a berm that was across. I saw pictures of it, uh, satellite pictures, and uh, I don't know if the lake ever came back to full the full size it was before. But Mother Nature has her way of doing things. So what do you think it looks like around there now? Is it like? Housing developments, or is this the same? I think, you so think? Right there, there no, a couple. Of, I had an iron worker buddy of mine that had a lot on that property, and uh, he told me he said he bought it in 1960, 60 something. Never went back down there to it. And I said, man, you should check that out. There might be a mobile home on your property. It better not be. I ain't been down there in years and years and years and years. I said, I tell you what, man, if you're not as what you say, well, you're not is where you say it is. I think there's somebody that you know, might have sold your lot and have a house on it, a mobile home. And then and, um, it wasn't long after that that he got killed in a car wreck. So I don't know if he ever checked it out. Maybe his kids did. You know, they might have found out that he had a lot down there. They had a lot of art. Somebody had. So that was Lake Delancey? Lake Delancey. In, uh, in Ocala National Forest? Yep. Highway 19, you go down Highway 19 and uh, go down through there, going to right, it's right before you get to Salt Springs. What other uh, kind of fishing did you guys do? Did you ever, did Ronnie ever do, like, I've seen pictures of him, like, I think down in the Keys where he'd caught a barracuda. Yeah, he, uh, he went, went uh, several times away from home fishing and uh, when he went out on the road, whatever. At home, he, he liked to go brim fishing. There's pictures of him with a string of brim. Um, I don't know if it was Bill Ferris that was with him. Um, or, right next to his house where he lived at there, he fished right there on his dock. In case was that on Doctor's Lake? At, when he caught those brim, that string, or that, there's a picture of him on there. I don't know if it was there or somewhere else that he went with somebody, whatever. So you guys, when you ever since you were little kids, you you went fishing like probably in a lot of the, the lakes over there near where you live, catching brim and stuff like Cedar that. Creek, yeah, man. Catch mullet. Mullet season come through there. We used to go down there, American Legion. I know Cedar Creek, there's San Juan. So that song where Ronnie talks about, uh, you don't want to, you know, ask me about my business. I won't ask you about yours. And, and he said, you want to talk about fishing, that'll be okay? Yeah. 
that's a pretty uh, accurate uh, description of, of Ronnie right there. He, he enjoyed going fishing. That was one of the things that he really liked to do. And Gene still likes to do that uh, because there's always a. I don't see one now, but usually there's a fishing pole. And is one, there one back there? There's one back there behind the seat. There's a, there's yeah, there's there's always a fishing pole in Gene's car. Every time I've ever gone somewhere with Gene or one on met him somewhere, I guarantee you there's one right yeah, there. Yeah, he he keeps a fishing pole in his car, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> so that's uh, something Ronnie liked to do, and uh, that's gonna. That's going to clear up any misconceptions about where the bass was caught and how it was caught. I don't know. What do you think happened to that wall mount? Uh, the last I heard, I think Melody has it. <laughs> yeah? Judy let Melody have it. That'd be... Uh, I saw a picture one time. I think they changed the nameplate on it. It may have been lost or whatever. And it caught my eye because of the, the date that they put on it. Um, I don't think the date that they got on it is right. Um, they may, the date that they have on it may be right when he got it back from the taxidermy, but it wasn't the day he caught it. But it's, it's his bass, he caught it. His family members got it, so everything's going to up and up. Yeah, yeah um, I just can't remember if it was 11 pound, 8 ounces, or 12 pound. What about... Uh how about you? Did you end up getting you a nice wall mount after that, jeans from somewhere? Yeah, I have a. Um, I have three of them. Now, you don't do that nowadays. You don't mount big old bass because you turn yeah. loose. Back right. then you did, you know. I had a, a 12 pound, 12 pound something. I had a 11 pounder and a 10 pounder. The only reason I mounted the 10 pounder is because that fish put up such a fight. You know, he was a, he fought and fought and fought and fought. And when I had him mounted, I named him Ali the Bass because he put up such a fight. I wish I hadn't done it because he was just 10 pounds. But it was, back then it was okay to do it. Nowadays I would never mount nothing. Where did you catch those at? Was it? Uh, Lake Delancey. Um, oh, so you went back to Delancey? I and went back there many times. Orange Lake, I caught the other two in Orange Lake. I caught two of my big ones there. Lost a bunch of big ones there. Were uh, most of them? Fishing. Oh, jigger fishing? Especially jigger fishing, yeah. You lose you lose really big, but you catch them, but you, when you jigger fish, you have to use anywhere from four to six treble hooks because when you that pole and that short line, when that big old bass hits that plug, boom, and take it, and there's, you don't have any, like, with the, the drag, you got the fighting with the pole, with that, with that fishing pole, and he hits it, boom, you got such a tight line, and he just ripped the hook out, ripped the, rip the uh, hooks out of his mouth, or if you have to have enough hooks that he can't rip them out because of the force. I was there fishing Orange Lake one night. I had just caught a seven pounder and I had him in the boat. And uh, the next strike, man, 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 that was a big bass. Big bass. And I lost him. Pitch black, pitch black. And so I kept fishing, kept jigger fishing, and had a strike. Missed him. I missed him. I had five strikes in a row that I missed. So that's it. I'm going home. I throw the John boat in the back of the truck, and I always put my jigger pole in the back and let it hang out by the by the bow of the boat. I put the jigger pole in there. Had a spinner bait on it, and um, as I looked at it, I went, "What the hell?" I grabbed it. Oh my God! That big old bass had took every one of them treble hooks and ripped them out of it. It opened up the. Uh, and they were through a, 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 the hole of the of the of the spinner bait. They had ripped and opened up the eye and took the hooks. So that's what you got to do every time when you're jigging fishing. When you catch, you hunt when if he gets off and you lose him, 
get a flashlight and you check and see if he takes your hooks. Yeah, because it. I be... didn't check, and that next five strikes would have been five big old bass. Oh, you were fishing on credit. <laughs> man, <laughs> man I, was, I was so mad, but I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson. Yeah. Well, yeah, you. <laughs> And yeah, I know yeah. the one weighs seven pounds because when I got to the closest store that we always stopped at, I weighed the bass, and that bass weighed seven pounds. How about like uh, when you guys would go fishing and did did I mean Ronnie did a lot of brim fishing too, yeah, right? Had, Ronnie fish. Oh, his daddy, um, Bill Ferris. You know he'd go fishing with a couple of people. You know, but we want to go bass fishing, and they didn't want somebody that would be talking no shit no it aggravating him, me and him would go fishing, you know, because he knew we was going bass fishing, and it wouldn't be no bullshit, you know. So you guys, like, when you were brim fishing, that's probably more of a relaxing thing, and you just sit there, and, yeah. and you got your uh, bait in the water, and just bullshitting. And... But when, when Gene Odom, you got no cooler full of beer, or no whiskey, and no cooler. Right. It was fishing. And if he wanted some of them other guys who want to go with fishing or whatever, and have a beer, they could get a take a six pack, put the fill up. No, Gene Odom was fishing, but hanging out in you know, Bill Ferris, which is his other really, really, really good friend. Um, Bill, Bill would indulge. Let's say Bill would indulge. And so, you know, he was Bill and Ronnie were real close, especially when. Is you know, he still around? Yeah. Yeah. Bill Ferris, he's a good guy. I really think good. I met him out at the. Uh at the Hill House property he came oh, yeah. out there. Yeah, he's cool as hell. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's a good guy. kind of a quiet guy. He don't yeah, yeah he don't talk he's smart, educated, real good a real good guy. Yeah. He was a he would indulge in the run to drink a little bit and look smoke a little bit of dope and whatever. But you know, if you wanted to go out and drink or want to have to do some drugs, you wouldn't have want Gene Odom hanging around. You know, because I just don't want a part of that. I'm just telling me to leave if you start to whip out the drugs and start right. drinking too much. And that's that's why he made you security yeah. of the band because he, he knew that you know that you were going to try to help yeah. eliminate a lot of that I stuff. Don't, I don't mind somebody doing what they like to do or what they want to do if they want to drink a little bit. But you're going to get drunk and loud and whatever and make a ass of yourself. I remember. I don't need no part of it. Yeah, here's Gene passing now. We're going to watch Gene. A Tesla. He's passing a Tesla. Yeah, so uh, Craig one time told me, he said, Gene Odom said he never got high or drank or anything. He said, that's a lie. Gene Odom got high because at one time he was on the plane and there's so much pot smoke blowing around in there. He said, Gene started kind of babbling a little bit, so we knew he was high. <laughs> that's possible because they smoked some pot on that plane. I know that. That's why there wasn't no drugs found when the plane crashed because he was not you know, drugs don't hang around drug addicts very long. Drugs will be gone. <laughs> Alcohol and drugs. Well, you, you know, you, you might have been high, you just don't remember. I just don't know it. <laughs> but I know for a fact, because I've never seen Gene take a, even a drink of or a sip of beer. Never nothing. So, uh, so yeah, Gene, Gene was probably a great influence for Ronnie to uh, try to help clean things up in the band. But where are we now, Gene? Are we, uh, we're heading through Keystone, we already went through Keystone Heights, right? Yeah, we just got through Keystone. This is Camp Landing. This is the old uh, Army base. Now it's, uh, they do a lot of training, uh, foreign soldiers train out there. A lot of National Guard, a lot of Army, lots of National Guard train out there. Do they have an airstrip there oh, too? Yeah. yeah, I believe that's where Joe Crimp said his dad, uh, did, he flew those planes. It was, uh, Whenever Joe was a kid, this uh, is a big, big base. This is this this base is probably 15 miles long, deep, and it goes that way for miles. This is a huge, huge, huge. So I know there's major airfields out there. Yeah. Years ago, the Navy they probably still do it. There's a bombing range out there. There used to be signs up here that says, "Beware of the noise. Freedom don't come cheap," or something like that. There used to be signs on the side of us. The Navy has bombing ranges out there. Yeah, how far away are we from the west side? Uh, about 20 miles. 20 miles. All right, this is uh, part two of the uh, 
hanging out with Gene and he just dropped me off right here and he just went by he, he's gonna turn around so we don't draw any uh, any uh, gawkers at, at me videoing this but uh, this location right here is, is a lot of people don't know is where Alan Collins got paralyzed he hit this culvert right here and I guess he was coming in this direction and not too many people know where this spot is and uh, this is the uh, area right here and you'd think it would have been something like a like a bigger ditch it got filled in some over the years and he was coming down the road uh, from this direction went around that curve and then he uh, I guess he was probably doing what he does and you know speeding and reckless driving like Alan Collins did and he went off the road and he hit that culvert right there and it was either him or the, the girl that was with him that got ejected from the vehicle but that's where Alan Collins got paralyzed so there's another little tidbit of information for the stoned roadie show so Gene just dropped me off and I videoed that area where Alan got paralyzed and, and the girl got killed. And what happened, Gene? What what exactly happened there? Well, he when he left his house right down here and he floored it all the way down there. And by the time he got down there, he was doing 90 miles an hour. And he went around the car on that curve, dog leg, and went around that car and the back end got light. And then back end went around and he went sideways right down in right down through the grass and hit that culvert sideways, you know, and jettisoned her through the window, hitting him, and took both of them out the window. And uh, I'm gonna go down here and turn around. Um, and killed her and paralyzed him. And you said you saw him in the hospital afterwards? Yeah, well, I went down to see him, you know, and, he, and the first thing he said was, I wasn't driving, Gene. They said I was driving, but I wasn't driving. I wasn't driving. Of course, I knew better. And I said, well, they, uh, they'll get to the bottom of it. Okay, Griff Martin out in the field for the Stone Roadie Show on assignment with Craig Reed. And uh, I'm riding around with Gene Odom. And Gene just dropped me off because I wanted to show you guys Gary Rossington's old gate entrance. And as you can see, there's a, an old rebel flag or an old well it's an old rebel flag in this iron gate and uh, they hung an American flag over the top of it so that uh, is Gary Rossington's original gate and uh, there's American flag on top of it I guess maybe there's some people complaining about it and it took us a little while to find Gary's old place but Gene remembered so uh, Gene dropped me off here. That's what it looked like. A little behind the scenes Leonard Skinner trivia. All right, we're back on the uh, Craig Reed podcast in the uh, in the field with Gene Odom, and uh, we're just wrapping the day up here. And uh, we're leaving the hell house. Buddy. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and open the screen up on the camera it's like a like a rocket scientist would and I'm gonna and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna ask Gene a question here uh, we're in the car riding back home from just left the hell house property so Gene whenever you were uh, growing up there and you and Ronnie were little kids and and you guys used to hang out riding bicycles and stuff he, and, and we were talking about we would be we were going through that neighborhood and what the hell would Ronnie think not I mean at that time had no idea knowing that one day he was going to have all these streets in the neighborhood named after songs he wrote and all of his songs are going to be all over the world being played when was it you found out that, that Ronnie was so well known as an artist and a writer in a rock and roll band. It was in '76 um, that I realized that they were getting bigger. I didn't know how big they were at the time, 
until he came by the house and um, uh, we went fishing. And um, he says, what you doing? I said, well, I'm laid off a week or two to, as soon as some work, to some work starts up. Iron working, you know, you between jobs. He said, hey man, we got about a week's tour lined up, 10 shows or something like that, seven or 10 shows, whatever. Northeast, this is winter time, winter of 76. He says, uh, come on out with me, man. Uh, come on, I'll show you what's going on. So we got up, went well, up north and uh, on the bus, riding from gig to the hotel to the gig. It was, it was snow, cold as hell. And I seen people, at this one show we went to, 20 miles away from the show, the stadium thing, standing in the snow up to their knees with signs that said, tickets, we need tickets. Have you tickets for sale? We need tickets. And I went, I'm thinking, to be 20 miles away in the snow trying to want to buy a ticket, you know? And I went, golly, uh, this is, and I said, man, alive. He said, yeah, Gene, he said, man, we've, we've gotten a lot bigger than the last time you saw us. And uh, I said, damn, I can't believe this. So then at the shows, I, I seen how big they had gotten, how big they were, how big they were getting. And um, we did the week's tour. And so we, we came home and he says, uh, good Lord, Rick, put that back down a little bit. I can't see nothing. I don't want to kill out his people on the road here. Um, um, What was he talking about? I'm working that down, Joe Biden. <laughs> talking about what uh, are the people standing in the snow and oh, they were. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. Um, I, and uh, I, said, <laughs> I, was, I was amazed at how big, how many people sold out. They were sold out. The shows were sold out. Wow, didn't I realize how big my fishing buddy was? And uh, coming home, he went, Man, I want you to work for me. I want you to, it's, I'm making good money now, big money. I need me a, my personal bodyguard. I need my fishing buddy. I want you to be my bodyguard. I said, man, I don't, you know, you know, I don't know about that. You know, I'll have a iron working. I'll have a. I'm already halfway there. I'll have a pension in ten years. I'll be. I can retire. You know, I'll have a pension. You hippies break up all the time. You dope heads and hippies and drunks. And band members break up and everything. And he said, no, man. He says, he says we going to Europe. He said, get your, get your. Get your passport. You, we're going to Europe. You can go with us. And I want you to work for me. I want you to be my bodyguard. I said, man, I, I, I said, number one, I can't go to Europe right now because I got a lawsuit. Union, a union lawsuit I'm involved in. I can't go. It's all right. Well, we're going to Europe. I'll, I'll see you when I get back. So when I came back from Europe, he came by the house. And uh, at that, I think I was still laid off or just got laid off again. And... Um, he said, you're working? I said, no, man. He says, all right, I'll be back in a minute. So he goes, takes off, and he comes back with a $1,000, 10 $100 bills, and he sticks them in my pocket. He says, catch your bills up, man. You're on the payroll. You're my bodyguard as of today. You're on the payroll. Uh, you, you know, and I so, um, that was just how I became. And that know, was what year was that? That was January or February '77, and so um, I was going to say, "Damn, come it!" Um, I, you know, became a uh, employee of Leonard Skinner Inc. And um, oh, we come back to me. I come back and can't get back in touch with me. Well, Rudd wanted to pay me. I said, "Hell no! I'm not working for you for that much money, man. That's..." I make twice as much as that iron working. I said, I'm not going to work for you and cut my salary in half and I'll make money. And I, you know, I have, I have my pension. He says, let you take the check. You accept the checks. And I'll pay you in cash for, to, to, to balance out what you make as an iron worker. And he said, so you won't make, you won't lose any money working for me and I'm gonna make you rich. You take care of me, I'll make you rich. So he started paying me in cash. Is that Ronnie saying that or Peter Rudd? Ronnie. Ronnie. And so he, I got my paychecks and then he paid me in cash. And plus, I got a hundred and 
that was $120 per diem back then. He says, you keep your per diem. You don't spend your per diem. You're all expense paid. I pay for all your expenses. So it was, it was good money, you know, for back then in 77. So um, I go to work for Ronnie, you know, Skinner. And um, when the plane crashes, um, mangled me up and so I don't work iron work for three years because I go through surgeries and plastic surgery and re-plastic surgery and more plastic surgery and not enough plastic surgery but anyway <laughs> um, back surgeries neck surgery anyway so um, I go back to iron work in 1980 and I work to January of 1990 and I fell doing addition on the brewery in Jacksonville, and I fell, got all booed up, banged up, banged up, broke up, mangled up, broke my back, my ribs, my neck, and in the hospital, the doctors man say, "Man, what happened to your neck and your back? You've got all this problem." And I said, "Yo, I was in an airplane crash ten years ago in 1977." Broke my neck, my back, broke my ribs all up, beat me up pretty bad, had a real bad head injury, and so forth and so on. So. Workman's Compensation deemed me uninsurable and said, you can't work anymore, you're going on Social Security. I said, nah, man, I'll heal up. The lawyer said, no, this is Florida state government, Social Security. Uh, I mean, Workman's Compensation is part of the government, Florida state, and they deem you uninsurable. You're just too beat up, too banged up to work. You have to go on Social Security. So I went down to Social Security and they already had my paperwork. The lady was cool as hell. Behind the, behind the computer. She said, yeah, Mr. Odom, we got all your paperwork and everything. You're totally disabled. You really you really can't even flip hamburgers. She said, I'm just saying that because you're so, your spine's so messed up, banged up. So you're going to go on Social Security. So she's on the computer. Quote. She said, oh, my God. And I went, what's that all about? She said, Mr. Odom, you're 40 years old, you're divorced, and your two children are grown. You're only going to receive 40-year-old single pension, $900 a month, is what my Social Security was. So I started drawing the $900 a month, and I went to the union hall, told the business station, I here's my paperwork, Social Security paperwork, and get my pension started. So. They call administrative services and say, you know, Gene Odom, disabled, union number, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he needs to start his pension. So they talked on the phone briefly, and he hung the phone up, and he went, damn, Gene, I got bad news for you. And that's all I ever get. He said, when the airplane crashed, you had 9.9 .9 credits. You had to have 10 to be vested. And since you didn't work 80 hours within a period of 12 months, you didn't work for three years, you lost that 9.9 .9 credit. So they went 10 years retirement right out the window. Oh, shit. Said your pension will be $377 a month. So I started drawing the 900 Social Security and 377. So when I turned 55, 15 years later, my 377 dropped to 277. So I went back to the union hall and I said, why did my check drop $100 a month? They called Mr. Administrative Services. Why did Gino do check drop $100? They spoke briefly on the phone. He said, Gene, I got more bad news for you. I said, what's that? He said, the way the charter is written, when you're on disability and you turn 55, you automatically switch to early retirement. And by you switching to early retirement, with the credits you have, you lose $100 a month. So 21 years of iron worker pension is $277 a month. Thank God my Social Security after 30, 32, 30 years, 32 years, has went up to $1,500 a month. So working with my old fishing buddy broke me. And, you know, well, only because he died. No, no not because, you know, because he died. But I, I regret working for him because it cost me everything. It cost me my pension. You know, the Social Security, but that's not their problem. You know, I was divorced and my children were grown. But God 
dang what it cost me working for the Leonard Skinner band. But you would have probably been okay at Ronnie. Oh, he would have taken care of you, though. Yeah, Lord have mercy. If he'd have lived, he'd be filthy, 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 filthy rich. And I'd probably be barely rich. Tell me that story about um, how the real Leonard Skinner, well, the, the Leonard Skinner band tried to kill you, and then the real Leonard Skinner tried to kill you. Oh, 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 man. Oh, um, <laughs> me and Leonard Skinner, Coach, we hung out a lot. And, uh, we, we went to a couple places, you know, and uh, we hung out a lot. But he was a coach, and he coached girls' fast pitch softball. He called me up one day. He said, hey, man, I'm going to come pick you up. I want you to see this girl. She can throw that ball underhanded 75 miles an hour. I went, what? He said, man, come on. You can't believe it. He said, I'm, she's amazing. So he had a little, he had a little, um, Mazda rotary, little Mazda rotary car came, a small car, two-seater. The overhead cam rotary yeah, engine. Yeah, um, or RX-7. And so um, he picked me up and we left the house and we were going to make a um, left turn on Temaquana. And the school bus was over that way. They were going to make a left turn and go down Temaquana uh, to the west and we was going to go east and so Leonard let the school bus come on out and make his turn before he made his left turn the school bus went out and just as Leonard was making a left turn a lady ran the red light and broadsided us and spun the car around and I felt my neck crack I, f I felt my neck break and I just grabbed my head over dad dang and Leonard was screaming hell at that lady and he got out of the car doing out there to cuss her out. A cop saw the accident, was over, and he circled around and came back, turned his lights on, and I'd already called 911, told him, I said, my neck, I was in a car wreck, and I know my neck's broke. I know it. And they said, the rescue's on the way. Do you know them luck? So we sat there and sat there and sat there and sat there and sat there, and, sat there, and they, the cop was finally with his report, was finished and everything. Leonard comes on and says, hey man, I gotta get to work. Um, I'm going to take you back to your car. Uh, I said, take me to my car. Did, did I, he even realize that your neck was no, injured? No, he said, I got to get to work. Man. I got to get to the to the game. I said, I got to go to the hospital. Get me to my car. So he dropped me off. And I drove myself to the hospital. And uh, went in there and told me I was in a car wreck. And then they had the x-ray and said, man, your neck's broke. I said, I know. I felt it crack. So they just put me in a turned me around and sent me into a room and then a little while later they came and they took me in for surgery and they fused my neck together. So when I got out of the hospital, I went to the fire station, the closest one, and I said, and so he pulled up on the computer and he said, oh yeah, here's your call. You ordered the, you ordered the, uh, the rescue unit because you, you said you thought your neck was broke and we sent the rescue unit I said it never showed up he says because the police officer canceled it I said how in the hell can he cancel my order so well if the police officer comes onto a scene and he don't think the rescue is needed he can turn it around if it's not needed I said that I said that I said man I was when I was smoking hot I said I'm gonna sue the shit out he said buddy he said it's right here on the tape everything's on tape it's, it all falls on the police officer because he made that decision. So I went back to that, right there at the, at the uh, on Blanding Boulevard at the uh, substation. Big old tall black sergeant. I said, uh, man, I want to know why this police officer canceled my thing when my neck was broken. And I was in the neck brace and everything. He said, man, I don't know. He said, I was raising hell. I said, get his ass over here. I want him to tell me why he canceled my rescue unit when I got a broke neck. And he said, well, let me, let me talk to him. So he talks to the guy oh, oh, outside on, on the phone. He comes back in. He said, I talked with him. And he, he said, I said, I want his ass here. Bring him here out in this parking lot. And he went, man, look here. I can't do that. He said, I can't do that. I was mad. I said, but listen, I want him to tell me why. And he said, listen, it was a, it's a training issue. He's going to be retrained. I said, oh, well. He said, I ain't gonna bring him here because you're too ill, you're too, you're too mad for me to bring him here. I said, well, I guarantee you, if you bring him here, I'll get to the bottom of it. So he didn't. 
And I went and talked to my buddy, my lawyer, and told him, he said, ah, shit, man, I'll sue the piss out of them. He said, that's a major lawsuit. I said, I don't want to sue them. I said, uh, I just hope the guy learns a damn lesson. He said, man, you're a fool, Gene. He said, that's a major lawsuit right there, buddy. Uh, I regret now not doing it because I can have a little money, but that's not Gene Odom's way. But, but the whole thing about Leonard Skinner didn't even realize it. <laughs> no, and he was so mad. Leonard's, Leonard Skinner was a mean redneck. He'd, like, he'd fight in a minute like that. Leonard Skinner was barred from the swamp when the, when the FSU and the Gators played. He could go to a game in Tallahassee when the Gators played in Tallahassee, but he couldn't go to a game at the Swamp because he'd get in fight with them Gator fans, beat the hell out of a bunch of them. Leonard Skinner was tough. Oh yeah, he was he, he was, was a redneck. College educated redneck. I yeah. loved him. He was, great, he was a great guy. But it was his way or the highway. Did, did, did you, you didn't go to school where he was a coach, right? I, w I would have if I would have got to high yeah. school. But I was taken out of Lakeshore at, in the ninth grade because me and two other guys averaged two and a half years older than the ninth grade student. If they were 15, we were 17 and a half. You know, or if they were 14, I don't know how old you are in the ninth grade. Um, if you're, and I failed to, to, uh, a couple of times early on. The hardest three years of my life was the third grade. Jesus Christ. <laughs> And so um, I was held back. But I wanted to go on to school and graduate and make something of myself. But Ralph Ogden was his name, the principal, the uh, superintendent. He took us out of school. I'll never forget them boys' names. Norbert Burleson, Norbert Burleson, and Dave Hollingsworth were the other two guys that they took out because of our age. When was the uh, first time that you remember meeting the, the Leonard Skinner uh, namesake? Leonard Skinner. Um, oh my God, probably. Um, I met him one time briefly, but I, I would say when we um, was probably at 77 when he, um, I met him a couple times, but he was always doing stuff um, that, that when we communicated back and forth was probably when he opened up, right before he opened up his first bar, Leonard Skinner's, he opened up, finally, I think he had three of them, a couple at the beach, and then one on the west side. We were friends before that, but we weren't close friends as we got after he opened up the bar. <laughs> <coughs> so, I, I have, I think, seen you were in an interview, and it might be on YouTube, with you two guys together. I think you probably did several interviews too, right? We probably did a few, yeah. So, so the, the story is that the band, Leonard Skinner, tried to kill Gene in a plane crash, and then Gene was almost killed by Leonard Skinner, yeah. <laughs> the namesake of the band. So that's what Gene means by Leonard Skinner and Leonard Skinner tried to kill Gene Odom. So this is another Gene Odom story that uh, is kind of, I found yeah, they interesting. Tried to kill me. They couldn't do it. They didn't get away with it. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up this uh, podcast. And uh, this is On the Road with Gene Odom. Hope everybody enjoyed it. And I'll see y'all next time. See you next time.